It's one o'clock. Uh, my name's Simon Gregory. So for, for our uh, Murdoch MS participants, my name will be at the bottom of the sheet that you signed. Um, and I was the person that you could contact if you wanted to, to find out more about the research. Um, but I've met quite a lot of you already, so hopefully um, I'll be making some new friends and meet some new people today. So today is ostensibly about a celebration. So about five or six years ago, um, I submitted a proposal to the, the Murdoch study, uh, submitted to Krist and Dr. Newby about collecting MS patients uh, and developing a new uh, cohort of, of individuals who are contributing their biospecimens. And now that we've reached around 1,000 patients, I thought it was really important to acknowledge um, that we've come to the end of that part of the study, at least, and uh, put on some great food from the Doe girls over there who've done a great job catering. Um, as a thank you, a really, it's, it's very uh, important for scientists to acknowledge that the samples we work on in the lab are actually attached or associated with individuals like yourselves. And so for us, it was a thank you for the participants in the study. But it's also a thank you to the guys who have uh, collected, um, participated in the collection of the samples, and also a thank you to the guys in the lab uh, who ran the samples. Um, so it's very important that we acknowledge everyone, not only the participants, but also the scientists that are helping push forward the boundaries of what we know about multiple sclerosis. So today, we're going to hear from uh, lots of people um, we've kept the talks fairly short. Obviously, uh, I'm the person at the top. Hopefully, I'm not wearing the same tie as uh, Jason is in his photo. Um, and then uh, we're going to hear from uh, Meredith Bostrom. So Dr. Bostrom will be taking you on a virtual tour of the uh, genomics lab. Dr. Kevin Nagy will be taking us through the metabolomics lab. And then we'll have uh, what we think is a, a pretty exciting extension to the collection of the samples. So this is the, the launching of our Discovery MS. Not only is it a website, but it's also a resource for the participants to keep up with what's happening with the research itself. Um, but it marks a, a new entity for us, a new um, phase of uh, raising funds, raising awareness for uh, continuing on with our, our research with the individual samples. And then Dr. Sabrina Cote, uh, awesome senior research staff scientist. She's pretty much everything down here for us working on MS, is going to take you through some of the exciting signatures that we've been able to catch a glimpse of to start off with. Uh, Dr. Kristen Newby, who is the uh, principal investigator of the overall MS, uh, sorry, the overall Murdoch study, is going to give you a bit of a description about what the Murdoch study is and the other sub-studies that we have. Uh, Dr. Dennis Coe will be taking us through uh, his research on how we've used uh, the samples in a particular field of looking at multiple sclerosis and infection. And then Dr. Lee Hartzell, who's a neurologist at Duke, is going to take us through uh, what I've called connected health. It's the development of next generation tools uh, and an app that is able to track uh, MS patients' symptoms uh, try and identify signatures of uh, disease development, etc., uh, and which really takes us through into sort of the application of these samples beyond just doing the research. It's also progressing into patient health as well. So the original proposal I submitted to Kristen was really to develop. Uh, I can't see see backwards over my head. Develop diagnostic and prognostic markers. So diagnostic markers of who may develop uh, such a terrible disease, and prognostic markers of uh, who's going to predict, uh, predict who's going to progress uh, with the disease itself. So it was important for us to outlay from the outset what it was that we were going to do with 1,000 samples. We were teaming up with the Core Lab at the David H. Murdoch Research Institute. So the fantastic thing about the Core Lab, if you exit this building and look straight ahead, you can't really miss it. It's the 300,000 square foot building across the, the expanse of grass there. And on the fourth floor are the core labs. So the advantage we have with the Murdoch MS study and uh, Discovery MS is that core lab provides us with the infrastructure for carrying out all the types of experiments that we want to carry out. And we'll hear about two of those core labs today. And by having a collection of biospecimens from the study participants, we can look at more than just a, a one-dimensional approach to trying to f find a cure uh, for multiple sclerosis. 
we, we don't have to limit ourselves just to looking at the genetics, the function of gene expression, the metabolomic, proteomic, etc., and pairing that with very important clinical data um, that we can have access to. And so that's a lot of sort of omic words at the bottom of this slide. So I was trying to figure out a way that I could actually uh, show them to you. So today I'm going to talk about how we uh, use those biospecimens for the generation of the data and the different avenues. So I'd be very remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fantastic neurologists who were able to, um, we've been able to partner with. In this context, Mike, Dr. Mike Kaufman, who is uh, at CMC, um, and he moved to Tennessee a couple of years ago. Mike was just an absolute fantastic uh, collaborator. Mike had tremendous enthusiasm for what we were trying to do. He was extremely supportive even before we'd collected the first sample. So Mike has um, had a, a significant, his thumbprint is uh, indelibly embedded on the collection because without Mike's support, without having someone of his stature in the MS community around Charlotte, we would never have started collecting samples. And then obviously it's uh, Dr. Conway was then supportive of Mike's effort. We have uh, Dr. Skeen, Dr. Eckstein and Dr. Hartzell who we'll hear from today who are neurologists at Duke who helped us collect at Duke. Uh, Dr. Hughes who is in Greenville in South Carolina was one of our sites. Um, Dr. Bodner and Dr. Connolly more locally and then Finally, uh, Dr. Mitch Friedman, Dr. John Scagnelli at uh, Raleigh Neu uh, Neurology Associates really got us across the line. We started collecting, like I said, five or six years ago, and it was really tough to get to the thousand that we were aiming for. And um, Mitch and John were extremely supportive, and I'm going to embarrass Nicole, because it was not embarrassing enough that I've put a red line around her box. But Nicole, do you want to just stand up for a second? Okay, so Nicole has just been awesome at Raleigh Neurology. So we've needed a Nicole wherever we start a study because they're a fantastic proponent for the study, someone who's on message. And we have this same person uh, for the Murdoch study. So Sarah Michael up here. We've even had children since this, this study has started. So Sarah, if you'd like to st stand, please. So Sarah and the team in the Murdoch office, uh, so we've got Emily uh, and Leah and Melissa and Carla, and Mickey and Perla and Ashley down there have all also been extremely supportive of the collection of these samples and it tr takes a tremendous infrastructure to underlie the collection of a thousand patients. So we've collected across the state, so the Murdoch study is primarily restricted to Kannapolis and Cabarrus counties. Um, but because MS affects 400,000 people in the US, it sounds like a lot, but if you spread it out across the whole country, there's not enough people with MS in the, um, those two counties for us to reach our 1,000 uh, uh, individual target. And so we went outside of Kannapolis and Cabarrus counties. We had mass enrollments in, in Asheville, in Davidson, in Wilmington. Um, at other neurology practices and the guys would turn up where there were probably one or more, two MS uh, individuals with MS in any one collection, they would turn up and try and collect your biospecimens. So they were fantastic across the state. However, you know, to get to our nearly 1,000 uh, uh, individual enrollments, we had to go beyond the state. We've even got people as far away as Texas, Maine, Florida, um, and in the Midwest who are participating in this study. And so the word about the study had gotten beyond just the confines of North and South Carolina. And we've been able to collect uh, very avid people who want to be part of the study further afield in the state and in the nation. So we've collected all sorts of patients, primarily relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, and some primary progressive. Uh, and then a couple of uh, NMO patients and even CIS patients are a part of the study. We do have another study that is actually still ongoing. We have a primary progressive study. So the overall, uh, the 976 is just the overall collection and we also have another collection of 24 uh, primary progressive patients. And these individuals, uh, the participants will be collected uh, twice a year for five years. And then um, Sabrina and I worked out the other day somewhat depressingly, we're not going to be finished until 2020, collecting that last biospecimen. 
Um, but here it's important for a progressive disease to collect um, sequential samples so we can see what sort of signatures are changing over time. So as I said, we've stopped uh, collection of the larger study for the time being, but for those uh, 24 very, very important participants in our primary progressive study, we're still going to be collecting biospecimens, as I said, until 2020. So how do I describe all those omics in a fairly simple analogy? So um, here we have a two-volume set of Julia Child's cookbook, How to Cook uh, French Food. And I thought it was very apropos given that we've all just finished eating now. So if you think of a cookbook as being the instructions uh, that are contained within our DNA. But our DNA isn't simply a collection of two cookbooks, it's actually a lot of cookbooks. And so uh, I've represented a very small segment of DNA, but just think of all the recipes that have ever been written. And that's what our DNA contains. Our DNA contains the instructions for everything, any recipe could ever uh, has been written or will be written. But it will just focus on these two chapters, to, uh, these two volumes today. So within a, <laughs> it'll be quiet you. Within these two books, we have particular recipes, and the recipes you can equate to RNA. So DNA is the instructions for everything. RNA in the form of a recipe is how it's carried out, and those bits of RNA then make proteins, or if you think they're the sort of the constituents of, of the meal itself. So we're actually looking at beef bourguignon, if you hadn't recognised it, if you can't quite read. Actually, I don't, did we have beef? We didn't have beef bourguignon for lunch. That would be too good. So we've got the instructions, we've got the, um, the components, and then we have the, the proteins themselves. And then what we also end up with, obviously, if you've eaten something, no, I'm not going to show you that picture. I'll show you an empty <laughs> plate. <laughs> show you an empty plate. So on this empty plate, you can figure out um, what was eaten, but you can't figure out the components of it. And so think of that as the metabolites. So the DNA is the cookbook, the RNA, the instructions, the proteins, the meal, and then the um, metabolites are what's left over. And, but in, as we know, in complex disease, you have the uh, influence of the environment. So you have your genetic predisposition, you have your signatures of disease, but you have the influence of the environment. And in MS, we know things like smoking, sunlight, um, possibly some sort of infection may be a trigger. And so it's in this context that we develop the disease. But I thought it was also important to show you what the tubes were that you gave for the participants in the study, what they're actually being used for. So you will have turned up to an enrolment office or you may have been tracked down in the street by the study team and they know that you've got MS. So you'll be giving a purple top tube. From that tube we uh, extract DNA. From the Pax gene tube, which is the next one, we have RNA. We also have serum and plasma that we spin down and each of the study sites actually isolates serum and plasma in the, uh, in the clinical labs. And then we have urine as well. We have the electronic medical records that we need to get an accurate diagnosis and even time to diagnosis. Um, but very, very importantly for us, all these samples are hidden behind a, an impenetrable firewall in that they're all anonymized. So no one can get access to those, uh, the information about those samples, all of those samples, unless they um, uh, are either part of the study team uh, or they apply and they have to go through a rigorous vetting before they have any access. But even then, once they get access to the samples, they don't have access to the clinical data and there's a disconnect between the clinical data and the people who've given the sample. So everything's uh, anonymised. So it's very, very secure. So what I thought I'd do is just give you an overview of all the different studies that we've started using the samples for. So again, DNA goes to RNA, to proteins, metabolites, and then I've also thrown in imaging as a means that we can profile uh, the progression or the development of MS. And so it's a bit of a whirlwind tour, but what we're hoping to have on the Discovery uh, MS website are all of these studies, as well as other resources that you can keep track of what we're up to. So instead of just focusing on the DNA or focusing on the proteins, we're casting a wide net, okay? So we're not just focusing on one of the components of the, uh, uh, of the pathway there. And aside from um, just myself, we're actually collaborating with a lot of people. So it's important that 
Um, there's different perspectives, different experience, different technologies, uh, different approaches, and we collaborate with these folks as well. So we're able to have a, uh, a really uh, broad application and we're not just pursuing uh, a fairly limited view of our research into the disease. So the first one I want to highlight is uh, Dr. Mari Shinohara. As we know, um, uh, uh, beta uh, uh, interferon treatment is a, um, a primary drug used to treat multiple sclerosis. And what Mari's been able to identify is that uh, interferon beta uh, recipients actually respond differently. We've known that for a while, that not everyone responds to the drug in exactly the same way. But what Mari's been able to do is identify um, a new model of non-responsiveness with respect to the development of interferon treatment. And this is uh, going to be published in a very prestigious journal, Nature Neuroscience, in the very near future. And so what we're able to do there is the methods that she uh, has identified as distinguishing the responders and non-responders, we've gone back into the um, Murdoch MS RNA samples uh, to identify people who have self-reported as being responders or not responders, and we've been able to identify a similar sort of signature in humans. And so we've taken from a mouse model uh, that's able to identify responders and non-responders and reflect that into the human samples, and we're seeing uh, signatures that are really important, and hopefully we can use those to distinguish before you actually get the treatment, who's going to respond or not respond. Um, Dr. Dennis Coe, who is sitting over there at the moment, will be coming up, so I won't talk too much about, uh, about his talk that he's going to present to us in a little while, but he's using a very interesting combination of genetics. So the DNA that we're born with and the predispositions we're born with, together with um, certain proteins that immune cells produce, to try and identify differences between uh, MS cases and controls. And he's, um, we're collaborating with him on the DNA, RNA, and the proteins. Dr. Sabrina Cote, Sabrina will be up talking in a little bit more um, about the signature that we've identified uh, from the serum that we've uh, obtained from the uh, Murdoch MS samples. And originally, we looked just at the metabolites, and we thought, well, how, how can we make it more informative? And so instead of just looking at metabolites, we're collaborating with Farron Briggs at Case Western uh, and Catherine Heller, who's at uh, Statistical Science and Math at Duke, to look at risk variants and RNA, which together with the metabolites give a signature for MS in individuals who have not taken drug. Okay? So invariably what you find is that these disease-modifying therapies will modulate each of these different components, obviously not the DNA, but the RNA, the proteins, and the metabolites. And so our first experiment was to look at individuals who are not taking uh, drugs to identify a signature, a predictive signature, who has the disease and who doesn't, so we can then develop um, a discovery tool or a diagnostic tool around uh, detecting MS before, for example, you have to have... Um, uh, a, a very expensive MRI, or you have to have a spinal tap for um, your banding of the CSF. Um, this slide actually summarizes eight years of work. Um, and so what we did in 2007, actually it's nine years, it's even more depressing. Uh, <laughs> nine years worth of work where we published the first gene to be associated with MS. And by association, I mean there were DNA differences in this gene, this interleukin-7 receptor, a difference in this DNA that was uh, present more frequently in individuals with MS than without. And that's it with, uh, in collaboration with Mariana Garcia Blanco, who's at the uh, University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, and we've since gone on to collaborate with Farron Briggs again at Case Western and Dennis Coe again to develop this fairly complex picture. So the gray box in the middle is the gene that we identified in 2007. We've uh, established its role in a particular pathway. We've established that this gene, DDX39B, is a new gene associated with MS. We've established that those two genes actually work together in um, uh, sort of splicing, as I've called it, which is just the differential use of components of the RNA. Um, and we've developed, taken three years to develop a, a mouse model. So this is on the cusp of giving us data that we can uh, understand. And the idea of translating it from human to mouse is that obviously you can't dissect, or you can, but you get in a lot of trouble. 
to sack humans for it. And so it's easy to understand some mechanisms in mouse in a mouse model than it is in humans. Um, so it's taken us a long time, and we've got a paper at Cell at the moment that we're trying to get published. Oh. I, would, I would ask the mouse model to mean that you have given the mouse. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, uh, in the human, um, so the original association, the DNA difference was in a part of the gene that is uh, alternatively included or excluded. In the mouse, it doesn't exclude that part of the gene. And so, what we've made are these models that exclude that part of the gene like it is in the human. So we've reflected uh, the function of that gene in mice as it is in humans. Um, and then once we've done that, you then induce an MS model of the disease called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, or EAE for short. So EAE is a fairly well-established uh, model of the disease that causes demyelination. Um, and you do get some recovery. There are different models out there for developing MS, but it's, it's one of the sort of traditional models. So it took us three years and I think probably $250,000 to uh, develop these three strains and um, make sure it's in a pure genetic background. By having a pure genetic background, you don't suffer from all the problems like you do with us humans. We're all a bunch of mutts and we're very genetically different from one another. And so having it in a pure background means that you take the genetics out of the picture and it's only the function of that gene and, you know, a couple of other mechanisms which may worsen it. And so we can focus just on this gene, just on the function of uh, the inclusion or exclusion of that part of the gene and then track its uh, process uh, when it develops a mouse model of MS. Um, it, the EAE model is actually being used uh, for the development of a couple of the primary drugs. And so it's, a mouse obviously isn't a human, um, but some of the mechanisms are appropriate for looking at, you know, how, how EAE is worsened or, or bettered. And EAE will come up a couple of times in the later slides. Yeah, yeah, that's another good question. I, I, it's like Susie's a, a plant for me. <laughs> Susie's just got the best questions. So the interesting thing about this gene is that it's also associated with rheumatoid arthritis um, and uh, type 2 diabetes. And so there's, there's the potential for the mouse models that we make for MS also being applicable to these other autoimmune diseases because we know with AI disease, uh, there's some overlap in the, the, the mechanisms. And so by being able to generate this IL-7R exon-6 knockout mouse, we can also apply it to other diseases as well. And so we're hoping that that's, you know, it will be, a, well, we hope that it behaves as it should once we induce EAE, and we hope that if it does, then we can use the whole mechanism for looking at these other autoimmune diseases. Um, Markers of MS progression. So Chun-Li Lu, who was at Duke, who's now at UC Berkeley, was awarded an NIH grant to look longitudinally at the changes of MRI during the development of MS. And so what he's looking for and Sarah is recruiting for, so if you want to participate, feel free to track Sarah down. So it's very, very high resolution imaging at baseline and then at the end of the first year and then at the end of the second year. And so he's been awarded funds to carry out the imaging to see if he can determine any predictive uh, value of these high, very high resolution MRIs. But what we've done is whenever you come in to get your uh, MRI taken, we'll also collect each of the tubes for all these other studies as well. Now we don't have the funds for looking at uh, the progression as it is associated with MRI, but we'll have the tubes in the freezer. So once we do have funding, once we have um, a connection between individuals who progress, so whether they're primary progressors, secondary progressors, or relapsing remitting, we'll already have the biospecimens banked in the freezer that we can then tie into the progression with the imaging. So uh, Chris Eckstein, who's, uh, so I direct the Duke Center for Research in Autoimmunity and Multiple Sclerosis, I'm the research director. 
uh, Chris is the co-director of that centre, um, who is the PI at Duke, um, and then Alan Song, who's in uh, biomedical engineering at Duke, is also involved. So here we're looking at the course of disease. So these are individual studies. The next couple of slides are going to have multiple studies on them. So again, the primary progressive uh, study where we collect a whole host of uh, biospecimens from these primary progressives. But our first experiment is to look at the expression of genes uh, within our primary progressives for which we've got four time points. So again, we take genetics out of it because we're comparing yourself to yourself but we look at the progression of the disease in the context of the genes that are expressed, the recipes, if you like, over a period of time, because it's important to figure out what the mechanisms are associated with the progression of the disease. So we're uh, looking at that. That's one study. Uh, another study, and this is looking at uh, EAE again, and you may have missed that little red thing that drifted down from the top, so I'll show you again. There it goes. So. I talked to you about RNA. What I didn't tell you about are there other uh, non-protein coding bits of the genome that regulate the expression of RNA, and these are called microRNA. And so in this study, um, a particularly talented lab analyst of mine, uh, Stephanie Arvai, who couldn't be with us today, and then a graduate student of mine who actually works on autism, but he's still keeping his foot in the door with um, uh, the EAE experiments is that we're inducing EAE. So this is the, you see the progression from the induction here. And the clinical score is uh, paralysis that starts at the tip of the tail and goes to the forelimbs. Uh, eventually becomes more, uh, its front forelimbs become paralyzed and it goes into a period of recovery here. What we're doing is obtaining uh, blood at these time points to see if we can figure out what are the mechanisms, what what's the RNA or the microRNA changes that happen over this period of time in the mouse. Um, because we think there are certain triggers that are associated with your immediate uh, immune response. And then there's a neurodegenerative phase that comes after the inflammatory response. We want to identify those mechanisms. Again, once we identify them in the mouse, we can go back into the human to see if there are any sort of changes with particular microRNAs or mRNAs uh, that could be implicated in the disease. We've identified one microRNA, so one of these out of, I think the hum uh, humans have six or 8,000 of them, um, which shows differences from baseline uh, to this time point here. There's a study that was published quite recently in a, in a, a pretty good journal. Um, they didn't find it because they weren't looking for it. Okay, so we've cast a very broad net again, uh, and we've been able to identify uh, one microRNA that we think is important. And for example, we'll then take that microRNA, knock it down in immune cells, and then see what happens to the immune cells. Uh, and then the third study, uh, looking at the course of disease, is working with, again with Chris Eckstein. Uh, it's a Duke Center for Research in Autoimmunity and Autoimmunity and MS, uh, DREAMS funded study where we're collecting CSF from um, anyone who goes through the Duke immunology clinics or even if they just have a CSF uh, recommended for TAP. And again, we will just bank it. We don't have a, um, an approach we want to use. We just want to bank the samples because you can't do the research unless you've got the samples banked. Um, and so that's part of the DREAM study. Um, and then I'll finish with two bits of, uh, two exciting bits or avenues of research that we're conducting. Uh, the first one is working with Eric Benner. So Eric is a pediatrician at Duke who works on um, cerebral palsy. And you think, well, how on earth is cerebral palsy similar to MS? Well, it has a demyelination component, so the stripping away of the myelin around the nerve cells that interrupt the transfer of um, you know, electrical signals. So I just bumped into Eric and listened to his talk one day, and then we got chatting about the study that he's doing on these particular um, oxysterols, as they're called, they're natural uh, occurring proteins within the body. Um, and so we're, we've got funds from uh, the DREAMS uh, Research Center to look at these in the context of MS, where we're going to, we think that they may influence inflammation and they may also promote remyelination. So that's pretty exciting. And that's work with Mari as well. 
And then the final study I'll talk about is just this one from uh, collaboration with Christian Gruber, who's at the University of Queensland. And so what he's able to identify are um, naturally occurring plants, plant proteins that actually decrease inflammation. Okay, so there's potential for uh, developing or uh, synthesizing these plant um, um, drugs, if you like, uh, which here's the course of EAE. It looks like the other one that I showed you before, but this is a publication from his in a, in a very good journal, which showed that there's sort of an attenuation of the severity of the clinical symptoms uh, with the uh, treatment with these uh, cyclotide molecules, as they're called. Okay. So that's how we've started with um, one proposal to Dr. Newby um, and all the different ways that we're going to apply these samples to furthering MS research or collaboration with folks uh, who are looking at things like inflammation or remyelination and how we can take those signatures back up to look at the biospecimens that we've collected uh, as part of the study. So none of this would be possible, absolutely none of it, without your contribution. So this is a very small token of uh, mine and my co-workers' uh, appreciation for the commitment that the participants have made in this study. And you know, as I said, we've got 976 participants, we've got 24 primary progressors. So putting on a spread like this is just a very, very small token um, of uh, our appreciation of your involvement in the study. And hopefully when we get to Discovery MS, the part on the um, schedule there, or schedule I should say, you will, uh, you'll be able to find a, a ready source of being able to identify um, the studies that we're, we're continuing with. There, there's flyers on your tables as well. All right, thank you. And uh, next. <laughs>